The recording has begun. Welcome to the April 13th uh, Chaos Community Meeting. Your minutes should be located in your chat. And if anyone needs them, just give a shout. We're happy to post those again. And if you have not put your name in the minutes, we would appreciate if you did so, if you felt like it. Um, so we do like to see who's coming to the meetings and um, things like that. So uh, we'd appreciate if you would log yourself. Um, we have a short agenda, only a few items on here. So we'll, we'll bust through these pretty quickly, I think. Um, Matt Snell, we'll just start with number one, which is the DNI badging. Uh, so Matt Snell asked me to just mention uh, in the meeting today, since he can't be here, um, they are releasing um, not, it, I would say if the badging initiative was versioned, this would be version 1.1. Um, they're making some improvements to some of the questions and some clarifications based on what we've experienced so far uh, with processing applications. So um, it's not a, a huge um, change to the initiative, but it is um, kind of a, a, a phased improvement. So um, congratulations to that whole team on just processing so many applications that we even have a, a base from which to work. Yeah. I mean, I think that's pretty awesome. So um, I think it, uh, to sum up just some of the, just as an example of some of the, the improvements that are made, for instance, we ask if um, events are displaying their demographic information for speakers and attendees. And for some events, this is the first year. So that question kind of doesn't super apply. Um, so just for as an example of, of things like that, that we've seen um, that uh, we're going to kind of just tweak a little bit. So um, so congratulations to Matt Snell and the team for working so hard on that. I mean, all the reviewers are doing an amazing job. If you have not seen the, um, any of the applications, it's a super interesting thread to read. If you have a moment and you're curious as to what things we ask and how those go, you can go to GitHub um, and just do slash badging and you'll see event badging initiative there. I'm um, gonna click on that and um, you can go to some of the closed PRs or, or the open ones, but the closed ones are the ones that have gone through the process completely. So, um, oh, thanks Matt for dropping the, uh, the link in the chat. Um, but it's, it's really very interesting to see, you know, how uh, we approach things and, and the conversations that go back and forth. So is there any questions? I should say, are there any questions on this? No questions. I just would echo your congrats to all. It's, it's just really nice to see this um, getting the traction that it's getting. Super cool. We are going to be tweeting about that. Um, I think Nicole's working on a social tile for us. Um, and uh, we, one of our recent um, groups, I guess, of, of events has been all the KubeCon. Uh, for anyone who missed it, we had this discussion last week, um, but we have badged all of the events and the, the uh, well, we've, we badged KubeCon, but also the, all of the other events that kind of are attached to that, which is a lot, I think maybe 12 total. So um, that was a lot of work and um, they're doing a fantastic job. So just want to give them a shout out as well. I guess one of the things that comes to mind is at this point, we've talked about doing badging for projects, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I honestly don't, maybe we talked about this last week too, but I just don't see how this, that's going to scale right now. We may have to, like, personally, I'm kind of putting that one aside for a little bit, like doing events has been enough just from a human perspective so far. Like I can't even imagine opening it up to projects <laughs> at the moment. No. Trouble with the data collection piece on the project that with events, you're talking about known populations and published populations, whereas projects, they'd have to go gather that. And there's still a fair amount of controversy with the best ways to gather demographic and information around projects, especially with the debate of remaining anonymous or not. So I think it gets a little bit sensitive and hairier. So for not prepared to tackle that yet either, I would say it's two reasons to not do that. The more reasons, the better at the moment. <laughs> and also with projects, they would require, I would imagine, um, you know, periodic updating and reapplying. And so it, with events, it's a lot of events do happen year after year, but 
sometimes not. And so at least it's like one and done. It's like a constrained (laughs) thing that's going to happen and then be done. And then maybe it'll come back next year. Maybe it won't. So yeah, agreed on that point, Matt. Any other comments on this? Rock on, we shall move forward. I dropped this next item in there um, just to bring people um, awareness to make sure people know that the um, all, mostly the All Things Open CFP closes pretty soon. It closes April 30th. So if you are considering applying for that or putting in a proposal for that, then you should probably do that sooner than later. Um, and then we also have OSSEU and then OSPOCON, which is attached to OSSEU. So um, just some other points of note. Um, I know we have talked about it a few times in these meetings, if people would like to um, submit papers for that or uh, proposals for speaking at those events. So um, I don't think chaos has a strict like process for that. I think we it's pretty open, like whoever wants to submit something they can. I don't think we have any like procedures or anything like that. So feel free to do that. You don't have to check. Our, you don't have to have our permission to do that is what I'm trying to say. And I think also there are probably a few of us that would be happy to do reviews if people want feedback before you submit it, because the better we can make the proposals on behalf of the project, the more likely we are to actually get them submitted. So a uh, value working group is considering on OSPOCON. So I'm preparing on it and I would love to get the feedback once I'll get something in written and I'll share with the community. I think in a prior meeting, we had also brought up the possibility of doing a panel. I don't know if that was still um, an option for us as a, a project. For OSPOCON, yeah, I think that is still an option. I was just uh, going to say yeah. may, maybe how, it was yours a panel, Vinod, or was it a presentation? Uh, I was open to the discussion. Like in the meeting, I asked for the ideas. Like then uh, it was like more of a 30 minute talk or like something, but okay. I, I haven't still done anything. So I'm just open to the ideas. Okay. Yeah, I think some of the risk metrics that we've developed, especially around licensing would be of significant interest at ASPOCON. And we have lots of examples that we've done there already. Elizabeth, you went off my yes. screen. Um, would, would, do you wanna, maybe you and I can connect over the course of the week to maybe put something together for all things open? Sure, yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Um, yeah, I don't know, we could figure it out. We don't even have to figure out the topic right here and right now, but yeah, it seems really cool. Yeah, I would join you if you were interested as well. You are invited. All right. Anybody else? I don't even know what it's about. So you just want to hang out with, with us. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what it starts out as. Yeah. So maybe we can bring something to the group next week because that would be a week ahead. And then to Don's point, you know, even if it's just some feedback in this meeting, that'd be cool. Apparently when I highlight something that brings it up. And blocks all the rest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's it's like random mouse movements cause pop-ups for me. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on if we don't have anything else to talk about with that. So the next one is chaos calendar questions. That's me. And the- so we're starting to get a lot of things on the chaos calendar. Like it's basically just full all day so should we have a couple because I like having the chaos calendar on my calendar but it does block a lot of stuff so I'm wondering like if we Sean like if you had auger things would you ever want an chaos colon auger calendar or uh, do people just want to keep it all in one I'm just talking because it seems like it's filling up like it's getting pretty full 
Unlike think... having one calendar where I can show it if I want to know what's going on in chaos and then I disable it again when cool. I'm not interested in what's going on in chaos and the ones that I plan to attend, I just copy into my own calendar. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. And the, ha having one calendar that we can have linked on the web, I think also makes that part a lot easier. Cool. It's also helpful if you're trying to um, <clears throat> play in something around, like when the chaos community Zoom link is open. So if you need to pop up an ad hoc meeting or something, you kind of know if it's already being used for something else. So you don't like bust in on someone else. <laughs> yeah. Great. So we shot down your idea, Matt. No, it was just, it was. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? Like, are you, do you I do. I'm super. It? I'm mad at all of you. I'm I, so mad. <laughs> so, so I will tell you what I do is the chaos events that I know that I'm going to participate in, like the meetings and things. I make a copy of them onto my own personal calendar from the chaos calendar, and then I turn the chaos chaos calendar on and off as as I need to look at it. Um, that makes it easier for me. Cause I do, I do like, and I've got calendar for my children, calendar for my wife, calendar for my research. So I have calendars, lots of calendars. I turn on and off depending on what I want to look at. Uh, so that's a strategy I use. One thought is I'm just thinking there without, so splitting up into multiple calendar means that you can color code and organize it, turn things off and on, but if you keep it as one calendar, we could, could come up with a consistent naming so that either if it's like a, a breakout or work value or a working group meeting versus a other kind of meeting or other kind of event, if we have a common lead in that is consistent across different kinds of meetings, then maybe mm -hmm. that's easier to filter and parse through. Because so looking at the calendar or not, right now, not even the cross working groups are the events labeled the same. So if there's consistency in like say community meeting versus even working, working group meeting, mm -hmm. uh, then it, maybe it'll be a little bit less toil to have so many events on it. I, I agree. That's a great idea. That that would make it much easier to visually inspect. Great. Cool. Do you want to give an action item to me to do that? I don't know that I have the, like, I don't know that I'm the owner of a lot of groups. So I don't know if do I you, can do that, but I can try. Do you own the calendar? Can you modify the calendar? Well, I don't know. I'm like an ad, I'm, I'm an admin, but I, I tried to change an event one time and I didn't own it. So it wouldn't let me totally uh, change it. Okay. I don't know, I don't know how things work. There's, there's some privilege that Kevin can give you that would let you move anything. Yeah. We'll take care of that offline. That's yeah. cool. Word up. I might just be doing it wrong too. It could absolutely be user error right here. So <laughs> no, that we probably picked the wrong permission category. Whoever assigned permissions would be my guess. Whenever I see okay. meetups and hack cutdowns, I always want to add get togethers. Yeah, just go ahead. I mean, let's have, I mean, I haven't seen any of you in face to face <laughs> in over a year. So like a chaos social hour, there's, uh, the Journal of Open Source Software created a, a social, like a happy hour gathering, which is at 6 a.m. Central Time. <laughs> Obviously a European-centered event, but I'm like, well, it's on a Friday, and I'm from Wisconsin, so. <laughs> I mean, that does kind of bring up a point, like maybe we want to just have like, like not office hours, but just like, hey, come hang out with us for half that's an what hour. This, that's what this was. Yeah. That's actually what this oh, meeting this start. That's, yeah. that's what this meeting, meeting was. Special. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. It's, just, it's just 6 a.m. my time, <laughs> you know. Do we, I mean, do we want to like change? I mean, I think this meeting works because I think we do have stuff to talk uh, about that's, you know, real, but I mean, we could add that. No, I, I think this is, I think this has worked well. I, yeah. We could add it like an yeah. office hour, but. And then it'll probably end up just being another meeting. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't want any more like work stuff. I just want like chill time. That'd be awesome. Okay, we'll think about that. 
Um, okay, so shall we move on? Yeah. Are we good? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, number four, Google Summer of Code ends today. Yes. Is the submit the sub well the submissions end today and then well, yeah I I select yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there. And they end today at 1 p.m. Central Time, so there's less than two hours left. So if you haven't done that and you want to, you should leave this meeting immediately and go do yeah. that. I've been monitoring our dashboard and there have been three new ones added um, today already. So okay, any questions on that? Last minute questions. Okay. We're gonna move on then. Here we go. All right, number five, metric stories. Gosh, we are only 23 minutes into this meeting. We're doing so well. This is the last item. So we have Speak to talk about this for a long time. Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> or we could just make the last bit the hangout time and we'll so, just stop the recording. Anyway, so, I mean, metric I'll, stories. I mean, I'll, I'll say for metric stories, we've done with Augur, um, I don't know, six or seven for different project groups and organizations. And Usually it's the our visualization API, and then we put them into some kind of uh, Google PowerPoint and share them to incorporate the whole story. And can they you, usually can, can you share those in a certain way with like I mean here? I can share links to some of them. That'd yeah. be helpful. Yeah, I I think I have I have permission from Kate Stewart to share hers. So let me just. I mean, uh, we can make all anonymous. My my thought is here is that as that, we that adds a layer for me, Matt. <laughs> that you have to that be adds, enough, you have to yeah, anonymize yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Anonymization adds a layer, so I would be uh, appreciative of uh, not having to add a layer of work. Just my thought. My thought here is, it, it has everything to do with filtering on the metrics. So as Every release comes out, our, our collection of metrics grows, obviously. And right now, the way the filtering is done is by focus area within a working group, which is a, that's a completely fine way to do filtering. Um, but the idea here is that we might want to start signaling to people, hey, are you starting an open source project? here's a collection of metrics that you might want to keep your eyes on early in the process or if you're thinking about joining a project um, from a corporate perspective where you're going to leverage the source code into a product that you're selling here's maybe a few things that you might want to take a look at um, your whatever the scenarios might be and just kind of orienting people a little bit to those collections of metrics. So I, looks like Sean has a few stories that we might be able to start with. Um, and, and maybe my, one of my slight concerns is, is that I haven't even clicked on these links. I've seen these before, Sean, but like oh, yeah, a, yeah. Lot of, a lot of your, a lot of the metrics you have here are composites of the atomic metrics. Right. You know what I mean? And and that's what people ask for when they want. Yeah. That when they want the story, they don't want discrete metrics. They want composites of sets of metrics. Right. Um, people don't, I mean, I haven't been asked, I don't think ever to show me a metric. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's what's on the dashboard. But when people want stories, they want a composite story that accumulates and, and often these are, some of these are one metric, but several filters applied to the metric. So like in the case of pull requests, mm -hmm. each of each, like there's a few at least in there that are a single metric, but they have different filters around time and uh, whether the pull request was successful or not applied to them. So distinguishing between this is a composite metric, this is a metric with these filters applied that would be, you know, a step to formalization of, mm -hmm. of these kinds of things so that the link 
directly back to the chaos metrics that are contributing and which filters are applied is more explicit. Um, obviously, the audiences for these um, for these these um, uh, stories haven't cared about that. But if we're going to put it on a website, I think it's really it would be helpful to indicate this is a composite of these metrics or this is this metric with these filters applied with with these values. Um, would it make sense if we were to get it on the website in some form, would it make sense to publish them as well titled blog posts? Would it make sense to release it as these stories as PDFs? Would it make sense to do you have thoughts on how we can get these in front of folks? I, so my, the first question that comes to my mind is, I think in whatever way that makes it sort of quick to find, um, or, you know, so perhaps it's a featured story um, on, on the website. That's, you know, like here's like, I don't know if we have a rotating banner. I can't remember our website. I don't want to switch off it because I'm sharing my screen. Um, but, you know, this, <clears throat> this would be a case where maybe like a rotating banner type of front. Um, like right now we have uh, community health. We have kind of like one big image. I just opened it in a different browser. Um, and there's a pretty easy WordPress plugin that would let us like rotate several things. And mm -hmm. one of them could be example metrics, because I think, I think more than, I don't think people are going to like poke around and navigate and find something like that. But I think if we put in place something like a rotating banner, which will be much easier for us to do when we have control of our website, um, would let us highlight different things that are happening for people who visit the website. Mm -hmm. That, that, that would be the way to get more clicks and interest and understanding really in anything we do, but uh, specifically could, this. Okay. Um, could we, would it make sense to do also tie that to like a regular cadence with Twitter where we, you know, kind of like what you yeah. do with the chaos weekly, you know, like here's a chaos metric story Hi, Don. Hi, Don. Yeah. Would it, you know what I mean? Like yeah, every, I, every Friday, not every Friday, but maybe every other Friday, like we work to yeah. write the story and then it goes out. Yeah. So. And I think, yeah, and I think, and then if you do the rotating banner kind of thing and tweet it, then I think probably a blog post is the, is sort of the best medium to have that image that you click on take you to. Okay. Um, so we're not trying to maintain a bunch of organized. I mean, to me, blog post means content, but it's not organized and curated. Um, and so it saves us a bunch of work trying to manage that over time. Yeah. And then it would be nice to have a little podcast episode about it. This is great. Uh, and yeah. So if Sophia said Okay. Also, just saying yes, I agree with the blog. Gotcha. If you have people downloading things, then you lose track of what happens to it. You don't see the long tail of reads. Gotcha. Okay, this is helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm just thinking about the podcast, the podcast idea. Like it would be nice to do a podcast. <clears throat> like, is there a it would be nice to have period, I would say not a one to one ratio between podcasts and blog posts, because I think that would get labor intensive, but some kind of periodic podcast focusing on particular blog posts. We can more... also do it the other way around, because we have some interesting stories coming onto the podcast and we talk about some specific metrics, um, but we can't go into the technical details like we could with the blog post when we don't have that visual support where we can include screenshots. So maybe as we are recording podcasts, we're thinking about, hey, is this a nice metric story that we can use and turn into a blog post? Yeah, I like that idea. 
because then it gives some it, it uh you can also have a link that then back to the podcast there's like a i don't know what, what do you call it like um brand insertion in a movie where somebody's drinking a coca-cola like we we reference the blog post in the Supplemental podcast messaging but yeah kind of it's brand placement i think is what they call it but it's it's <laughs> like you know mutual brand placement So I think we're. The, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So the the methods for sharing these and the you know website banners and things like that are kind of trivial. I think mm -hmm. the 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 problem with this is actually generating the initial content, these stories. Uh, I think that's kind of where we need to focus right now. Uh, And, and we, we have, I guess I would say we have a lot of stories. I think it's talking to the individuals for whom those, these stories have been constructed and having permission to share their stories. And, I don't, and then, I don't uh, know in every case if, so we, and we may need to just sort of generate stories on some, ran, some random set of, or less, more public set of repositories than some of the things that people want stories for. So I, it, I think if the if the stories are coming from from users or from uh, just people in general, then we kind of need to deconstruct them to put them into the context of chaos metrics, right? So if if we're just if they're just coming in that way, we need to deconstruct them. Uh, if we provide them a dashboard and ask them to say, you know, what does this mean to you, uh, then the then the chaos context is is already there. I think both of those options work, but either way, connecting them to chaos metrics and telling the stories of what these metrics mean to people is in a in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. It that's the that's the difficult part, right? Once um, it, it, once we have that, categorizing them on the website is mm -hmm. fairly trivial, or uh, or tweeting them or so um, yeah go ahead sorry one of the thing one of the things we do with auger is i embed we embed the caption for each visualization in it so constructing a story that follows the caption and essentially interprets the data um it, they're kind of like almost written and it's just a question of putting a beginning, a middle, and an end around it. And and the, the beginning is why are we in, why is that group or why would we be interested in this? And the middle is here's what we found in each area, and the end is maybe actions that groups took at the end. You know what what are what kind of activity or action or or change did this work inspire? Yeah, the last part again, Sean. So the, the the so every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end is what are the actions that a group that uh, you know had the story told or told the story took as a result of having a clearer understanding of their community. Or, or even it could even be actions that they plan to take or consider. Right? Like we may not, we may not like we're not we're not investigative reporters. We're not reverse engineering Watergate. So to Kevin's point, I think he's concerned about who is going to write these and how that's going to go. Because that is a pretty big commitment. If we're going to say this is something we're doing on the regular, um, that would, you know, or or is the idea that we're going to get others to guest post on the blog to tell their own stories, mm -hmm. or or what? Like, what do we see the direction going in? I'm hoping they'll write I mean, themselves. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think I can go back to the six or seven that we've done and you know, up, update them and see if there's uh, permission to do a, do a story and put it in a frame. And it's, it's relatively little work because we've, we've got a system for generating 
everything except the narrative. Um, and, and the stories narrative. can be really short. So I just wrote yeah. like beginning, middle, and end. The beginning is the context that's hoping to be better understood. Right. So just really simply, this is, we're trying to, to gain a better understanding because we are a company that's looking to leverage this open source in the products that we sell. Like just a very high level, that might be too high level, but just a very high level kind of narrative to capture people's attention. And then the middle, not exactly the story format, but the middle is these are the metrics that can help reveal, not perfectly, but help again, move us off zero to gain insight with respect to this particular context. Right. In the end, and then the end is to Sean's point, now that we have this, once you get this information, what do you what do you do with it? Why does it matter play a meaning? Yeah, why does it matter or play a meaningful mm -hmm. role for you? And so I think these stories can be like like maybe a grand total of of you know 10 sentences, right? It's just these are they're they're not like long narratives. Mm -hmm. Um that was kind of my vision. So uh, a little while back, I had mentioned that I kind of saw the community reports as a platform where we could do this. I, yep. uh, I, I think this I would... is a rebirth of the community reports is what I'm hearing. Like it's a, re it's a reconceptualization of what they are. So we could actually build some of this into the current community report form so that part of the narrative is automated. Uh, when they request it. And then we could create a follow-up form that would kind of ask them some questions about use uh, that would further help us automate the, the creation of something like this. Uh, just a thought. Could I suggest an action item for me and Sean mm -hmm. to write one of these for next week? That might be like eight, eight lines, 10 lines that has a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. Next week. Yeah. I think uh you okay with that, Sean. I, that's an achievable action item. The action item story, a very short story for a very simple context, like keep it, you know, I guess today, one of the things that I was thinking about is, um, you know, oftentimes in this context, we, at least I do, I have a, I get located in the conversations that we have with organizations and people who are pretty skilled when it comes to open source. Right. Um, they're, they're pretty far along. I just part of me today was thinking there, I think there are a lot of organizations and a lot of people that just don't even know where to begin. Like they just, it's just really difficult. And, you know, if we talk like about some really deep levels of involvement or, or, um, engagement that some of these really uh, long-term committed organizations to open source have, like sometimes those conversations are pretty overwhelming, I think. They just want to know, like, I just want to use open source in my company and not have it, you know, like bite me later because I wasn't looking at the license. Like just really, I just want to make sure that my developers are doing the right thing. Right, so what, what should we be looking at in that regard? Like, so sometimes part of me is like, we need to think about these stories for organizations and people who are really still pretty new to this. That's, but maybe that's not the right. Yeah, case. I mean, I I I agree. Matt, are you? 
seeing um, a correlation between this concept and those toolkits that you, we had talked about a long time ago and that we kind of wanted to provide for the community to help them figure out where to start? Yeah, it is. So maybe we put it in a toolkit form. I'm not sure. Right, so like, okay, so I'm in Omaha, right? I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. That's what this I've is, heard. This is not, not like necessarily the epicenter of high tech organizations, but it's a lot of organizations that rely heavily on technology. And so many of the organizations in the city are using open source, perhaps unbeknownst to them in many yeah. different ways. Yes. Right? It's almost certainly yeah. the case. Yes. And so like, how do we help organizations like that even start crossing the threshold to be conscious, you know, very more deliberately engaged, I should say, with open source? Like, what are the things that they should be keeping their eyes on? And I'm not just talking about companies here in Omaha, that was just an example. Um, and that's a different group of companies sometimes that we talk to, like the, the different group of companies that are attending Open Source Summit North America or the membership summit. That's a, sometimes a very different group of companies, um, but we're all kind of in this giant boat together <laughs> and different people are in different spots. And I think sometimes if we keep talking about, um, if we keep speaking the language of all the folks that are in say the member summit, let's just totally pick that randomly, um, it, it leaves out people or organizations who aren't there yet. <laughs> they're just not at that at that level. So they're the, the organizations that are using open source in their environment. So they probably want to understand just what what open source projects do they have that are several versions behind what the current release is or right it's because the open source stuff is embedded in things that they're purchasing so i'm hearing a little bit uh different viewpoints here so this started talking about running reports essentially for open source projects to help them be healthier and have a better feel for what they're doing what's going on in their communities, their own level of engagement and their own level of activity and things like that. Um, but then there's this other piece that is for on the company side of those who are using open source. So with those two things, like, are, are they on the same? Uh, like, are they the same? Are they different? I feel like they're different and they are different goals, unless the ultimate goal is to increase corporate engagement in open source across the board then maybe that's like, if that's what we're trying to do, I guess, I guess I just want to make sure that we understand why we're doing this. Like we want to help, but like, what, what's the end goal? Like, what's the goal that we're, if we do the goal question metric approach, what's the goal that we're trying to solve here or to figure out? My perception was when we started the community report, it was more of a marketing for the chaos, like, telling the community that chaos existed and this is how we can help you as a community to look into your help. I don't know whether is, that is still the goal or we are moving in over the period of time to some other directions. So are the two things you're hearing, Elizabeth, is it like how to help a community get a better understanding about themselves, like one. And then number two is as organizations, mine was a corporate example, but any organization that's looking to engage with open source questions that they might have. And that's kind of case number two, is that right? That's what I'm hearing y'all say, Okay, but I could be wrong. So correct me if that's wrong. I don't want to confuse the issue, but I think we actually have to add a third thing to that as well. And that is uh, as chaos, we are in the, uh, we, we are identifying and defining metrics and that, that should always be a, a goal in what we're doing. And through these, these outreach programs or initiatives, the building dashboards, getting these user stories those interactions create uh, validity for what we're doing, right? So we, 
we can figure out what metrics are important through these stories. Uh, and they help us define and identify metrics as well. And to me, that's almost number one. So Elizabeth, I don't, I, I see, I see your point and maybe it's um, without like a lame answer, like it's both, but maybe it's both, right? But maybe we can't do both at one time, right? So like our first ask is how do we help communities gain a better understanding? Here are the things that you might want to, like, let's just start there first, right? And then if that goes well, then the next is as organizations are seeking to participate, here are the things to look, here are the different contexts where you might might want to care about what's going on within a community. Mm -hmm. That Does that help? Yes, 100%. And then to Kevin's point, metrics is the tool that we use to mm -hmm. bring that together and to show this is what you can look at. Yeah, it's metrics is the central po point of it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm getting too meta here, but it seems like that's a story in itself and not necessarily, it would have an example that weaves it through, but I, I really liked Kevin's point of that's what grounds this project and what we're trying to accomplish. And I think building stories around how people use metrics, there's always going to be context of who they are, what they're trying to do, whether or not they're in a corporate setting or in a project setting, but metrics is the common language in between them. So I think it's it's almost, I wanna say explaining the, the value that metrics can provide to these different types of settings, but it might need to be introduced. I think just kind of starting with the story as an example, but it, you'd have to have some context in there. So I feel like it might be, again, if you're trying to provide more of a basic introduction for those that are less familiar with why these things are important, then an example illustrates it, but the first one would have to provide that view or some guidance in how we see the importance of metrics for, for all communities involved. Maybe that's my analyst bias speaking. I'm trying to capture this in the minutes. Sean, can you scroll down a little bit? Mm -hmm. Metrics is, metrics are. And I do think we're talking, I think the, the corporate user of open source is a different audience that may require a different story. Mm -hmm. And to the point of um, uh, Georg and the podcast link, so I know that we are trying to get one of the um, people who have submitted a bunch of applications um, to kind of talk about that process and things. But I think that's that's another use case, right? Is how they're using metrics to inform how they um, put on an event. So what if, okay, I know we're at the end of time, but maybe to Kevin, in Sophia's point, what if there is a first blog post that kind of says this, like metrics are the common language that can provide insight. We can look at this in a variety of different contexts, but it really kind of boils down to the work that we're doing here in the chaos project. But that, as opposed to just being tied to a single story, and then we can always point back to that first blog post. I like that a lot. That kind okay. of sets up the, the scene. Right, it would, yeah, it's kind of set it up a little bit. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Sophia. All right. Cool. Thank you, everybody. I, All right. We are, yeah, we're at uh, a minute over time, but it's uh, there's been a great discussion here at the end and all throughout. Good recovery. Definitely have. I will cease to share. I will cease to record. <laughs>